Hello everyone, it's Benny, and I wanted to introduce you to Mr. Mark King, who requested to be in this video. Hello! Alright, so the first thing on the agenda. I missed a small thing in building the decoders. That is, this block right here. If I have something stored in the cache, you notice, because this has a power of 1, it will automatically go through the bus and to our AOU output bus, and that's, that's just not what we want. Fortunately, the solution is very simple. Replace all these blocks with just simple wire. And it's really that easy. The only time this gets a little bit tricky is right here, because otherwise this will start bleeding into, well, the spiral staircase, and that's not what we want. So instead, I'm going to break these blocks, and I'm going to fall down into the void and fly back up. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go down like this. Through here, I can sit and a repeater this way. Oh yeah, make sure you have a block here. I think that might have been here from earlier, an earlier recording, so <laughs> sorry about that. But yeah, I have that. Connect wires, there you go. Simple as that. And also with this, I realized you don't actually need to move this down if you don't want to. Technically, it doesn't matter, but because I am, well, I am who I am, and I have to have this where I want it to be, so I'm going to move this one up, because there's no reason for it not to be in its original location. Again, doesn't matter, you could leave it how it was, it's not going to make any difference whatsoever in the long run, as far as I can tell anyways, <laughs> but yeah. So there you go. So today we are going to be starting on the control unit, good and proper, and I suspect this will be a very interesting video, because here I'm going to diverge significantly from the conventional or wisdom on control units. And I'll talk about that right now. So, when it comes to building this, the control unit, there are essentially two key philosophies. The first philosophy, make it as small and fast as possible. Make it do exactly what it needs to, nothing else, compact that in as much as possible, and boom, there you go. This is a very appealing philosophy for uh, obvious reasons, and it works amazingly well. If you do your decoder design right, you can get a decoder that's just a couple of logic gates and runs in two or three ticks. It is ridiculous. So this is option number one, the combinatorial decoder option. It's an awesome option, for that very reason. It's small, it's fast, doesn't require a lot of redstone. It's great. There are, however, two key drawbacks to this philosophy of doing things. Drawback number one. It's really, really dependent on your instruction set and the hardware you're building for. If you change your instruction set even slightly, like, ooh, there's just one instruction I just figured out and I think it would make a huge difference to the computer, or ooh, maybe if I just do this one small trick of the hardware, it'll make so many things simpler. Too bad, you have to pretty much throw it away and start again. And that's a bit of a problem, because determining the best decoder for a given instruction set and hardware combo, it's not easy. In fact, I have reason to believe that finding the optimal decoder is NP-hard, although you can find good ones much faster than that. But still, you get the idea. It's not exactly a trivial thing when this happens. But I don't want to blow this out of proportion. It's definitely not the end of the world if this happens. It's, it's doable. And really, if you're going to go for this, I would recommend simply, as much as you possibly can, build all the hardware you can, get your instruction set as refined and finalized as possible, just to minimize the risk of this happening. Save the control unit for 
as late in the design process as possible to minimize the chance of this happening, and if it does, at least minimize the number of times it happens. So, again, not perfect, but livable. The real nail in the coffin, though, is something else. The thing is, with this way of building a control unit, certain instruction sets will not really work well with certain sets of hardware. And again, I don't want to blow this too far out of proportion. If you have a horribly mismatched instruction set and hardware combo, you're talking instead of two or three ticks, maybe four or five ticks to decode, and maybe two or three times the number of logic gates. So it's definitely not the end of the world when this happens. But, I mean, obviously, if you're using the combinatorial decoder method, or whatever it's called, I'm just calling it that for something to call it. If you're using this method, then obviously you want to take as much advantage of it as possible. Because otherwise, why wouldn't you use a different one that's maybe a better fit for your system? So if you're doing that, you're going to want to design your instruction set so that it fits within those limits as much as it reasonably can, so that you know, you'll get the best size and performance and be able to decode really, really quickly. But, again, that puts limits on what instructions you can add to your instruction sets. And sometimes that means some really useful instructions really can't be added without completely screwing up this decoding thing. And, you know, that's... You know, again, not in the world. I don't really don't want to blow us out of proportion. This isn't... This doesn't kill this method. This is a perfectly valid way of doing control units. It's a good way of doing control units, even. And I don't want to turn you off to trying this just because, spoiler alert, I'm not going to go with it. <laughs> but, yeah. So these are just some issues. And I think considering those issues and the CPU I have in mind, there's another philosophy that will work better. So, the other big philosophy as you can see in front of you, is microcode. And here's how this works. In the so-called combinatorial decoder philosophy, you go directly from your instruction, wherever it comes from, instruction goes to the decoder, and the decoder spits out, hey CPU, do this. Very direct, straightforward process, optimized as much as possible. The microcode process instead does that in two stages. The instruction is decoded into microcode, and then the microcode decides what the CPU should or shouldn't be doing. And you might be wondering, all right, what's the point of that? Why would you want a two-stage decode like that? The reason is, well, there's several reasons. The biggest of which, in my opinion, is flexibility. With microcode, you can change what any instruction does at any time in the process, and there's no real hardware penalty to that. It's as fast as it is, and it doesn't get any slower or bigger or whatever, depending on what you code the different instructions to do. They can do anything you want. In fact, this is a really good thing because it provides independence of what the hardware does and what a good instruction set for your hardware is. In fact, you can implement an instruction set that has basically nothing whatsoever to do with your hardware at all, and you could still get it running pretty well just by decoding all those unrelated instruction set instructions into microcode, and then the microcode will tell the CPU, hey, do this to emulate this instruction set. Of course, we're not actually going to do that. In reality, the advantage of this is instructions that are really, really useful, but don't necessarily fit into a pattern that would be uh, amenable to a combinatorial decoder, they can be done in microcode with no additional penalty. So you can really, if you do it right, you can really, really set up a set of instructions that takes full advantage of the hardware, gives the programmer total control. And that is really what you want when you're designing instructions. You want the programmer to be able to control the hardware as efficiently as possible. Another really cool thing about microcode is microprograms. You don't necessarily have to have a one-to-one -one relationship 
to instruction set instruction and something the CPU does. You could, for example, have a multiply instruction that will decode into microcode, and this will sort of do like an iterative loop and do the multiplication as is with the hardware we have, no special multiplier or anything. And one of the cool things about that is this can utilize the hardware more efficiently than you would if you wrote a program to do it, because the microcode has control over aspects of the hardware that you just don't have control over in the instruction set itself. For example, branch prediction. In general purpose code, you're going to set up a branch predictor that will make an educated guess about which branch you take next, and that'll keep instructions flowing. You don't have to wait a huge amount of time for, you know, branching. That is good. But the thing is, in a multiplication program, you have a pretty good idea of how the branch behavior is going to behave, you know? As long as you're in the loop, you're going to keep on pretty much going to keep branching, and then at the end, you know, it's the end. So you could hard code a more accurate branch prediction if you wanted, just for an example. And the microcode can also have more direct control over things like the cache, so you can preload in data that you need into the cache, either instruction or data cache. So basically, there's just a lot of little things you can take advantage of in microcode that you can't necessarily do in the instruction set, and aren't exactly desirable to do in the instruction set either. So, again, more power over the hardware gives you the ability to write better programs. And if you really want to take it to the next level, you can have a certain set of the microcode that's actually addressable. You could read and write to it. So, and what you could do here is you could, say, have your program generate a specialized microprogram for the most performance-intensive part of your computation, and then, well, it's all good. You have a really super-fast, highly optimized version of whatever you need to do, and you'll barely need any instructions to do it. So, basically, there's a lot of really cool things you can do with this. I don't know if I exactly am going to go quite into that much detail with it, but, you know, there's things that are available. Now, microcode is not a magic bullet. There are a number of disadvantages to it, most notably the size, speed, and complexity. So. Obviously, this is going to be big and complex. That's not necessarily a problem, but again, it's something to consider. Personally, I think it's fair to trade off the complexity in the hardware as opposed to the complexity in trying to figure out the instruction set. So, you know, I think it's a fair trade in that part. The speed, however, this really depends on what kind of CPU you're building. If you're building a straightforward, non-pipeline CPU, then, yeah, this is going to have a notable impact. This is probably going to add another stage to your decode. Maybe two more? Maybe? But probably just one. So, really, you're looking at maybe, for the type of CPU I'm building, you're looking at maybe 80% of the speed you get compared to directly decoding, which is notable. The thing is, though, in a pipeline design, this really is not quite as much of an issue. The only real penalty is when you mispredict a branch, you're going to have an extra stage to wade through to recover from a mispredict. So it's not, in my opinion, that's not really a, a huge trade-off. As long as you have a decent branch predictor, it's really not that much of an issue. So there is a size and speed disadvantage, and that depends on what you're working with, but I think for our purposes, it's a fair trade for the sheer power and flexibility of having microcode. So yeah, that's what we're going to be doing, and there you go. Now, I'd like to go over my current draft of the instruction set. Now, I'd like to mention this is a work in progress. 
I have been adding and making changes to this even up to just before I recorded this. So this is by no means final, and I am 100% confident I'm going to change it and add more as before we finish with this. So uh, take this with a grain of salt, but I still think this is a pretty decent representation of what you can expect our instruction set to look like. First thing you might notice is right now, well, just to show you how this works, these are the different instructions. I haven't assigned any of them to any specific opcode number, so these are just, you know, they're there. I'll figure out which instruction maps to which opcode later. It doesn't, it doesn't matter too much in a microcode design, so that's, again, one of the benefits. But yeah. So these are what the instructions look like. These are the individual lines of microcode that implement them. So, for example, addition is implemented with this particular line of microcode, and each on and off bit corresponds to which control line needs to be activated in order for the instruction to be reformed. And as you notice, right now, every instruction only maps to a single line of microcode. So we're really not taking a lot of advantage of, the, of our control unit paradigm in this particular revision. I'm planning on saving the more uh, involved instructions for later on. But yeah, I think this is a good start. And this also means that for our first draft of building the control unit, our system's going to look a whole lot like the naive way of decoding instructions. Which, you know, it's alright. So that means this won't be too terribly conceptually difficult in the build. It's just going to be pretty straightforward. And later on, we'll add the stuff that makes it into more of a full microcode controller as we need them. But yeah, here's the basic layout of the instruction set. We have the arithmetic instructions, which are addition and subtraction. We can also add or subtract with carry, which is really cool because that allows us to do more than 8-bit addition or subtraction. We have shifts and rotates. Again, pretty, pretty cool. And the cool thing about shifts and rotates is these don't need to use the accumulator. So we can shift or rotate any arbitrary register, and it'll just shift that register. There you go. No need to bother with the accumulator. So that's really cool. We have our logic functions. I'm still not entirely convinced whether I want a nor function or just a straight-up not function, but, you know, it's there. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. We have decrement and increment, also really cool because don't affect the accumulator. You can decrement or increment a register in place, no need to touch the accumulator. The accumulator can just sort of stay there. We have compare instructions, which are there just to set the flags. And we have our data moving instructions. We can move data into the register or out of the register. We can move data from the accumulator to memory or from memory to the accumulator using the register as the memory location. And of course, we can lo load an immediate. So we can specify an 8-bit number in the instruction itself that we want to store in a particular register, which is, you know, kind of cool. And we have this really cool, a swap instruction. So we can swap the accumulator with any register, just in one instruction, one cycle, simple as that. They're swapped. Really cool, really useful. And yeah, it's just, it's a really nice thing. And we have jumps, of course. So we can jump to an address, our register. In this case, we'll determine the flag. And we can jump to, just straight up, jump to a particular register. So, there you go. This is the basic idea of so far the instruction set. There's going to be more to this, and I'm going to make changes to it, because that's how I am. And yeah, I also have more potential instructions, not sure about yet. But you know, these are things I'm considering. May or may not add them. Probably going to add this one, because, I mean, otherwise, what's the point of having vectorization? But, but yeah. And I guess I haven't talked about how our instruction itself is going to be laid out. So, uh, let me show you that next. So, as I mentioned earlier in the series, we're going to have a pretty straightforward 8-bit instruction set. We're going to have a 5-bit opcode. This is where we select which one of those instructions we're executing. And this specifies which register we're operating on. Or, in the case of the jump instruction, which flag we're jumping based on. So, really, really straightforward, really simple, no fancy tricks to it. And only 8 bits per instruction. Now, the trick is, there isn't always 8 bits per instruction. 
if we need an immediate value, that's an optional extra. So, uh, yeah, we sometimes have to deal with two bytes per instruction, and that's just something we're going to have to deal with. It's one of the limitations of having, you know, <laughs> on only eight bits of instruction set and an eight-bit computer. So yeah, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover here. Wow, that took the entire video. <laughs> you know, I had kind of hoped to actually build something today, but alas, all the stuff is really important because we're undergoing a shift in focus now. Now the issue isn't just, this is what we need to do, how do we do it efficiently as possible. Now we're entering the bridge between hardware and software, where the issue is, okay, the software could want to do literally anything. How can we allow that software to do that with this hardware as efficiently as possible? How can we enable that? And that, it's a little bit of a different challenge. It requires a different mindset and a different set of tricks to do it effectively. So, yeah. I think now we've laid the foundation of how we're going to start doing that, and in the next few videos we're going to start implementing. And yeah, thank you. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned. And I'll see you next time. And before I go, I have a special message for those of you who come on the OR server. If you don't come on the OR server, you can ignore this. This doesn't apply to you. But for those of you who do, I notice there's a little bit of a trend where people will like to come on the OR server, see if I'm recording, and if they are, try and fly in front of me in various forms and fashions to get in the video. You know, I get it. I can understand it can be kind of exciting to try and be in a, a video. That's why I try to accommodate people who do like to get in the video. I think, you know, like earlier, if you want to be in the video and you ask me, I try to let people in. I think, you know, I don't have an issue with it. But randomly flying in at, at intervals like that, that is an issue. That Actually, that's no different than griefing. You, if you're going to do that, you might as well take World Edit and just delete a whole chunk of the computer. Because, I, mean, I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but when you do that, you've completely ruined all the footage I've just recorded up until that point. It's not like I can stop, cut that out, and continue and have it be any natural order. I have to re-record the entire thing to get that natural flow back in. And it also breaks my mental flow, because then, you know, my mind's not thinking about what I'm trying to talk about, what I'm trying to show you guys. It's now on, hey, there's a guy in front of me flying around in a rowboat. What's up with that? Or, you know, whatever they're doing. So, you know, I'd, I'd, just, I'd really appreciate it if you don't do that. It would, It's hard enough to record videos as it is, and this week I spent more time trying to dodge people who wanted to do that than I did actually recording this video. So, yeah, I again, just, I'd really appreciate it if you'd lay off on that. If you do want to be in a video, great, ask me about it. I'm usually pretty happy to accommodate people who want that, but please don't just randomly fly in. That's that's just destroys videos, and in fact, if it keeps up at this rate, one day I might have to miss a week solely due to not able to record video from people griefing my video. So, yeah, just throwing that out there.